Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Go ahead and um, turn there. If you haven't started the recording, you can go ahead and do that already. Uh, Romans chapter 6. So <clears throat> let me remind you about Romans chapter 6 now that uh, it's, it's an incredibly important section in terms of how now should we live. If we're Christians, how should we view ourselves, life, sin, the law, those sort of things? Let's read from verse, actually verse 11. We'll read from verse 11 to the end of the chapter, and then I'll provide some additional context, and maybe the Lord will speak again as, been, as He has been so faithful to do already. <clears throat> verse 11, likewise you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lusts. Do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you were, or just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard of righteousness, or to righteousness. And what fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now... Having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end, everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. There are three questions that arise as a result of the teachings of chapter 4 and 5. So we've been going verse by verse through books of the Bible, and in the book of Romans, a letter written to a church that existed in Rome at the time Paul's writing this, right? Now, he didn't know most of the people in this church, and he's writing this uh, so that they would know certain things that he would often teach in person, but he's writing this so that they would understand these critically important doctrines, doctrines, truths, so that they would live by these things. Uh, how you get saved, how you should live once you're saved, who needs to be saved, all those things, we've covered those things already. At this part, though, we, we get to these, this, this kind of this catch here where Paul is saying to himself, they're going to have these ideas in their head because of what I've said, but because of what I've just written in chapter 5, which we remember now he wrote that we're saved by, we're justified by grace through faith, not of works, that we're not under the law, and that even though the law which was given by God through Moses even though that law caused sin to abound, which makes you scratch your head, why would God send the law into the world if He knew it would cause us to sin more? And we all can relate to that. You know, give me a bunch of rules, I'll look for my favorite ones to break. I mean, it's just my, my nature. He says, even though you're going to sin more because of the law, my grace, God says, abounds much more than your sin. And so in this teaching, Paul thinks to himself, these they're, they're going to come up with some ideas because of this truth, and, and they're going to be bad ideas that if I don't say something about them, that's going to cause their Christianity to be ineffective and a death existence and, and a, a, a brokenness and, and something that they'll dread for the rest of their lives. And so he sets out to answer three questions. Track with me in verse 1 of chapter 6 real quick. The first question, he, he actually states it, and he says in Verse 1 of chapter 6, what shall we say? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? In other words, well, if, if 
the grace of God is greater than all men's sin, then what difference does it make if we sin? We'll just get more grace. And he answers in verses 1 through 14 why that's a ridiculous thought. Question number two is found in verse 15. It was, we, we just read it a second ago here. Question number two is, well, if we're not under the law, since we're not under the law, then why, why should it matter if we sin or not? Since the law is not our tutor, since the law is, I mean, it is our tutor, since it's not our, our God, we don't, we're not under the law. The law isn't sovereign over us. It doesn't control us anymore. What difference does it make if we sin? And then now we're going to talk about the answer to that question today, all the way through chapter 7, verse 6. And then in chapter 7, verse 7, you can look over there for a second too. The third question, which is a little bit different in nature than the, than the first two, the first two are about behavior. You notice that? Shall we sin since grace abounds in sin? Shall we sin since the law is not our, our, our sovereign anymore? But verse 7 of chapter 7 is more of a philosophical understanding of the law. And the question there is, well, since the law couldn't save us, is the law then also sin? Is it somehow flawed? Because he knows they're going to start thinking these things as they work through these issues. The answer to that question, as we'll see next week, is absolutely not. The law is actually perfect. We'll, we'll see next week. The law converts the souls. It brings us face to face with our sin. The law serves a tremendous purpose, and the law is perfect. But the weakness of our flesh is the problem, right? And so that's the context. Now, a lot of people have derived a lot of really bad doctrine because they don't look at these two chapters through the lens of those three questions. Those three questions clearly govern every verse in these two chapters. Do you understand that? You see that? So there'll be people that'll tell you that your works or your righteousness is somehow part of your salvation. You can't go to heaven unless you stop sinning. They'll try to teach you that. That's not what these chapters or verses say. They don't say that. In fact, they say just the opposite of that. They talk about the importance that we grow, uh, that we foster a, a growing hatred of our sin, but yet the means of obtaining the, the freedom out from under that sin is not human effort or fleshly effort, but worshiping God. Go back to verse 11 again with me in chapter 6. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves dead, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin. So there's a there's a cooperation that's required. You want to be freed from sin? You have to cooperate with the work that God promises to do in you to do that. First of all, you need to decide for yourself whether you're going to let God call you a sinner. If I walked up to you in the street, you never met me before, and I said, you're a sinner, what would you say? Who are you to talk to call me a sinner? Or would you say, Amen. I'm saved by the blood of Christ, though. No matter who was saying it to you. So are you willing to be called a sinner? Is God allowed to tell you that you're a sinner? If, if, you're, if the answer to that question, first and foremost, is no, I want to be the one to decide whether I'm a sinner or not, not anybody else, not the Bible, not God, then how can you reckon yourselves dead to sin in the first place? You have to say, in the same way that, you're, that you've, you've seen stories of communities that shun people who go against their traditions or their beliefs. You need to think that way about your former life in sin. You need to shun it. I'm dead to that anymore. I, that's not part of who I am anymore. And, and that's, what I'm, that's what the next section after the comma says, but you see, if you, if you take something out, you need to replace it with its opposite. If you don't do that, you'll return to that again. So I'm dead to sin, but I'm alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And this is often the distinction between the Christian who has an alive spiritual existence, who's on fire, and who even though they still sin, they don't walk around like Eeyore. Woe is me, you know, I'm so... It's just who I am, I was born this way. Why? Because they reckon themselves every day dead to sin. And they present themselves to God every day to be cleansed. Alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord, therefore, again, your participation, verse 12, do not let, you're the one that determines the, permiss the permissibility, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. And underline mortal body because this is talking about your earthly existence and your flesh. This is about your flesh, right? 
Do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey its lust. And do not then present your members, obviously not members of the congregation, <laughs> but members, your appendages, your feet, your hands. Don't let your feet lead you. Don't let your feet you know, walk you into a place where you know temptation is going to capture you. You guys can, anybody, we have room up front, come on up the sides if you want, whatever you want to do. Do not let sin rule over you. Do not let your members lead you to places where you know you should not go. Don't let it happen. You're the one that gives it permission to do so. Do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness. Instead, what do you replace that with? You present yourselves, not your members, not your appendages. You take your whole self. Your, your whole being, and you present it before God. Not once, every day, always, you present yourself. I've often told people, you are made up of three things. You are body, soul, and spirit. And unless you take all three of those things and present them to God and reckon yourself in Christ, dead to sin, with all three of those things, you're going to live an out-of-balance life. Most people focus on that which is tangible, their, their, you know, anything that's, that you can touch or, or taste or smell. Or that, that, that's their focus of their life, their flesh, their body. But we all see what happens, right? And all you got to do is look at a profile and you can see what happens, you know. It's not good. No matter how hard I try, this body's going to fail me. And that's the same way it is spiritually. If you try to live according to this body, it's going to fail you. You have to live in the spirit. You have to reckon yourself dead to sin. You have to not allow your flesh to lead you around. And so presenting yourselves as instruments of righteousness to God. An example of, of the failure that the failure of humanity would be David. Who remembers in um, 2 Samuel chapter 11, right? You remember 2 Samuel chapter 11? David, King David at this point in his life. It says there, if, you, if you've never noticed, when at the time of year when kings were supposed to be out with their armies at war. At that time of year, where was David? Serving his flesh. Taking rest when he was supposed to be doing something else. It wouldn't say at the time when he was supposed to be someplace else if he wasn't supposed to be someplace else. He was taking for himself fleshly rest. And, and in doing so, wandered up to the rooftops, looked across to another rooftop, and saw there something that appealed to his flesh. A woman a beautiful woman, but not his woman. It was Uriah's wife. Where was Uriah? Out at the battle where he was supposed to be. And so what happens, we know the story, is he has a servant go and he sends for Bathsheba. She comes to him and he sins with her and the result is she becomes pregnant. And in an effort to cover his sin, he makes sure that Uriah dies to cover his sin. And that's obviously a death existence for David, as he later on has to repent and come back from that. It's an awful experience. You remember, you remember Nathan, right? You're the man, David, and it's not in a good way. There's another story that's also a true story that I think I first heard from um, David Guzik or one of the really smart guys, but it, it's from the 14th century and in, in, in England. Um, Two brothers who were the sons of a king. The king passed away, and the brothers was uh, the younger brother was Edward. The older brother was Reynold. You, you remember these two characters from English history, Reynold and, and Edward. And Reynold had a oh, let me let me look up his his nickname because um, his nickname was Crassus, or I don't know how to pronounce Crassus or whatever. That was from the Latin, and it meant fat, obese. Okay, so. This guy was called by a nickname that meant, you're too big. <laughs> Not very nice. But that was the older brother, Reynold, and the younger brother. And these two fought over the province of their, their, their father used to oversee. And it was divided for a while, but they fought, and they each wanted each other's land. Well, the younger brother, Edward, eventually won and took prisoner his older brother, Reynold, who was really obese. And he took him back to the palace where he lived and created a room there in the palace. And in creating this room, he built a wall, created a room, and he built a, a standard-sized doorway. And, but he, his brother was in the room intentionally before the wall was built. And, and the brother was so big, he literally could not fit through that door. 
So the, so the younger brother said, I'm not even going to lock the door, and, and I'm, gonna, I'm so cruel to my brother, I'm going to send him his favorite food every single day, and so much of it that he won't be able to resist it. And he said to his brother, the second you want to let yourself out of this room, you have the power to do so. At any time, you can leave. All you have to do is stop eating so much, and eventually you'll lose the weight and be able to leave the room. He was a prisoner to his own sin. You understand that? We think we control it. It controls us. Later on, Edward died in battle. And months, and and then the wall was torn down, and Reynold was allowed to come out and put him back on the throne without having to to deal with that problem. But it eventually, months later, killed him. It killed him. Sin brings forth death. Don't miss that point. Also, my pastor used to tell a story at the Bible college because he knew that this particular story the Bible college students would never forget. We call the story Monkey Nuts. You ever heard this story, Monkey Nuts? In places in the world where, where they love to eat monkeys' brains and things, you know, for as delicacies, you're all going, ew. The natives, what they'll do to capture monkeys is they know this one kind of tree has a hollow spot inside. And so what they'll do is they'll bore a hole in the tree just big enough for the monkey to get his hand through the hole. And then inside the hole, they put these these special nuts that these monkeys can't resist. And so what these monkeys will do is they'll find, they'll smell the nuts and they'll come and they'll stick their hand and they'll grab a handful of these nuts. And when they go to pull their hand out, they can't get it out because of the nuts that made their hand so big. And so what the natives do at that point, because the monkeys refuse to let go of the nuts, is they walk up with a club and they smack them in the head, and when they, when they knock them out, they drop the nuts, they pull their hand out, and that's it, they're caught. Sin is the same way, folks, because when you grab hold of it and when it gets inside of you and you can't let it go anymore and you can't release, it, you can't release yourself from it, it will destroy you. And somebody will eat your brains. (laughs) I'm just saying. Hence the saying, and you remember this hopefully, sin will take you further than you wanted to go, cost you more than you were wanting to pay, and keep you there longer than you were willing to stay. You'll be imprisoned to your own sin. And monkey nuts, don't forget that. Verse 14, the context now established, it said, for sin shall not have dominion over you. You remember the fact that what God is trying to establish is who is your sovereign? Is, are you still in Adam? Remember from previous verses, are you still in Adam or are, is Christ now your federal head? On the day of judgment, who will be your representative? Who will be your champion? Will it be Adam or will it be Christ? And if it's Adam, then sin has, you're under the law and sin has dominion over you. But in verse 14, in Christ, it shall never be. Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. The grace of God, the gift of God, free gift of God we learned last week. Now, not free to God. He spent an awful lot to purchase you, but free to you. Because you couldn't do anything to earn or deserve it. And as a result of your salvation and as a result of sin not having dominion over you, you have the potential to live a certain way. And as a result of your life, you can be changed. Your character, everything about you can be changed. Turn to Galatians 5 for a second. And verse 22 through 25. Paul's talking about this reality of a new way of living. And this is how we should now think of ourselves. And he talks about it in the sense of it becomes then a natural reality of you not being under the dominion of sin, but now being under the dominion or the sovereign of God. He said the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, a product of the Spirit. This is, this is not, you're not a factory when it comes to holiness and righteousness. You can't be good. You can't manufacture goodness. You can't be a Christian. You can only follow Christ. You can only worship Jesus. And what happens as a result of that is you bear fruit. Think about it this way. A factory, if, you, if I say the word factory, images come to mind. For example, punching a time clock every morning, you've got to be there by a certain time. The work bell whistles. 
you go to your machine and you punch widgets all day or whatever it is that you do at your factory. And at the end of the day, if you've met your quota and you punch out at a certain time, you get your paycheck. You know, you get what you, you are compensated for what you manufacture. Righteousness and holiness do not come that way. That's not the way it works with God. Instead, it becomes a fruit. Now, when I say the word fruit, what comes to mind? All of a sudden, in my mind, it's a vineyard or it's a, 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 it's a, um, a place where there's a bunch of orange or apple trees or, or a garden, and, and you have there then plants, and those plants simply, uh, they're rooted in the soil, and the nutrients in the soil become their reality as they draw from the ground. And then also as the sun comes out and they draw from the sun, as the rain falls, they draw from the rain, and, and as a result, they naturally, suddenly... Fruit happens. It's, it's a relational reality to them simply being what they're supposed to be. They're not, they're not there trying to produce fruit. It's not like, do da da you know, look at there, I did, you know, there's another one. No, no, no. They're just being what they're supposed to be, and fruit happens. Righteousness is the same way. Be Believe and be what you're supposed to be, and it happens naturally. Righteousness is a relational reality. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and here's the one for our focus today, self-control. You should be able to understand the definitions of sin and righteousness you should then be able to bring your flesh under the control of the will of God with the help of God as a relational reality as you follow God and worship Him. Back to chapter 6 and verse 15. Well, let me finish that thought. There's a couple of additional thoughts there. So, self-control. And he says, and he continues, and he says, against such these characteristics of a fruit of the Spirit, there's no law. You're not under the law. Because... You're, you're, you're worshiping God, and as a result of worshiping God, God has saved you, and there's no law for that. And then verse 24, those who are Christ's, the possession of Christ, notice the language. Those who are Christ's, who do you belong to? Those who are Christ's, they have crucified the flesh, there's your part, with its passions and desires. You have crucified, you put to death. That's the cross, that's the image where Christ, you know, hung on the cross, crucified, Right? Remember how we talk about that language, Jesus saying, if you want to follow after me, take up your cross every day and follow. Go to the cross, take yourself, allow yourself to be, your selfishness, your self-intent and purpose and will and desire to be crucified. Then and only then can you follow me. You can't have it both ways. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Verse 15, what then, since we're not under the law, as I just proved from Galatians, We're not under the law. When we get to heaven one day, the law is irrelevant. If you're in Christ and you go before the throne, the white throne judgment, the law is nowhere in the mind of anyone in the room for you. Why? Because they see you and they see Christ standing there for you. They see his death, his burial, his resurrection. They see his blood. There's no sin for you. There's no law for you. The law effectively helped deliver you there, but there's no law. You're not under the law. So if that's the the, the case, here's that second question. By the way, that apparently was my introduction. (laughs) Shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? And he answers the question and then develops the thought further. He says, absolutely no. No way. It's part of a philosophy of how we live and how we see ourselves in life now. If we agree with the Bible, we will hate sin. We will see sin as poison for our soul and our spirit. We will see it as something that's fleshly in nature, earthly in nature, temporal in nature, not eternal. It'll destroy you. We see it as poison. I was recently uh, flipping around Facebook. I know, hard to believe, right? caught a video of a guy being interviewed. There's a big bunch of people on, on being interviewed. There's this is one guy, and, and uh, they were saying, one guy says to, to the other guy, he says, you know, I heard that you, don't, that you quit drinking. And the guy says, yeah, I don't, I don't drink alcohol anymore. And he says, it's funny because when I tell people that, 
this, I get this strange response. They'll often say to me, oh, oh, what happened? What happened? What do you mean, what happened? They'll say things like, you know, were you drunk driving and hurt some? Did you kill somebody? As, as if there's something wrong with you because you quit drinking, because you quit poisoning yourself, there's something wrong with you. And then he says this, he says, you know, it's funny, because if I were to say to those same people, you know, I stopped drinking water, they'd go, so? Why is that no big deal? Why is that? Why would you stop drinking water? That's what's good for you. Maybe it has something to do with the fact that their own personal convictions are, is that they... For you, stop, you stopping your alcohol is bringing conviction upon them, and they, they don't want to think the problem's with them. They want to think it's with you, you know? And again, I don't, get, don't cross the message here. I'm not saying drinking alcohol is sin, but I am saying it's poison. Alcohol is poison. And so you want to do that? We want to drink some alcohol? Yeah, and you know what? So fine. But you start drinking too much of it, it poisons your body. Amen. Why would we want to poison ourselves? Why would we want to, you know, listen, here, you're, you're dying of thirst. Here's six cups of water. The three on this side have various amounts of poison, and these three have none. You know, just, well, just drink whichever one. It doesn't matter. No. Why would you do that? Why would we think it's okay to mess with sin? Why would we want to poison ourselves? Verse 16, do you not know that, and that, by, the, by the way, that phrase is going to be continued. We're going to see that, do you not know, in chapter 7, verse 1. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves, slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? Who do you present yourself to? Who do you make yourself subject to? What, what choice will you make? It's, it's, again, it's all within the realm of your own moral authority. Ephesians 6, for example... Paul's giving an example of if you're in a situation where you've made yourself a slave to somebody, bondservant, he says, bondservants, be obedient to those who are your master according to the flesh with fear and trembling in sincerity of heart. And that, by the way, becomes a critically important section of this verse. And the section we're in today is, is your heart, the sincerity of your heart. As to Christ, not with eye service. You know what that means, eye service? In Hawaii, they say, hey, brah, why you give me stink eye? You know, like if you're, if, if, if you're telling me something to do and I go, fine, and I, give, and I kind of look at you out this corner of my eyes, I'm giving you stink guy. I don't really want to do it. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not wanting to please you, but I'm doing it because you got me. You're making me do it. No, not like that. It has to be with sincerity of heart, not with stink eye. Not with eye service as, me, as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ. You've chosen who to worship, now doing the will of God from the heart. You want to do the right thing. You know, your flesh is giving you eye service, but you're not giving eye service in your spirit to God, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he's a slave or free. If we're truly saved, it means that Jesus is now our master and we need to be fully submitted and happy about it. Our goal every day should be surrendering to the will of God, verse 17. But God be thanked, back in chapter 6 of Romans, God be thanked, who else do we thank? That though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart. Heart. The heart needs to be brought into the light, transparent allowing the desires that are there to be cr criticized by the truth, allowing the desires, you know, to be, to be uh, brought to, to bear upon the truth of the gospel. In fact, look how he defines it. He says, you obeyed from the heart, what? That form of doctrine w to which you were delivered. How did Jesus put it? You shall know the that's doctrine. And the truth shall make you free. Not a slave. Not a slave to the law. Free to not sin anymore. Free from the person that you once were. Free now to allow your creator to define your life. 
You obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Have you ever thought about your affections of the doctrine of salvation and how much you love the fact that God has justified you apart from works? I think about it a lot. Every time I sin, I think about it. I've seen my share of Christians, and even do today, who accept Christ as their Savior, confess Him as their Savior, but fail to exalt Christ as Lord. And they walk around with a sort of death spiritual existence, tormenting themselves by permitting sin to continue and scratching their head and trying to figure out what happened. Verse 18, and having been set free from sin, you became then slaves of righteousness. While here on earth, we're bound either to sin or to righteousness. But when in eternity, when in eternity we reach, sin will cease, peace will rule with effortless ease. We'll be free from temptation, free from sin. I speak, he says in verse 19, in human terms. Why? Because of the weakness of your flesh. You need to be told these things. I need to be told these things. Every day I need to understand that my flesh is not my friend. It is my enemy. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you had presented your members previously as slaves of uncleanness and lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, continuing that concept of, you know, you try to obey. This is you're trying to obey the will of God in the flesh. It leads to more lawlessness. So now present your members your appendages as slaves of righteousness for the purpose of holiness. Worship and serve God. His righteousness becomes my reality. I bear fruit for the Lord. Verse 20, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness, or so you thought anyway. You lived as though there was no law or that you were a law to yourself. God's definition of righteousness is the only one that actually matters. He created everything, and He defines everything. And so therefore, if, if there is a such thing as right and wrong, the one who authored right and wrong gets to decide it. For when we were slaves of sin, we were free in regard to righteousness because we didn't acknowledge God. We didn't exalt Him. Going back to chapter 1 is God in our hearts. We didn't lift Him up every day and let Him be God. We were a God to ourselves. And he says, you have your fruit to holiness at the end, everlasting life, because you're in Christ, because you're not under the law, because sin does not rule over you. And the end of this new life you now have is what? Everlasting life. That's not just something that we thought up as humanity went along and developed. It's something that God has promised us. Everlasting life, eternal life with God in heaven, free from the old nature, the old flesh, the desire to sin, temptation, done away with, sickness, disease, all done away with, our flesh gone forever. And then he continues, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God. And last week, again, we learned the free gift of God, not free to God. It cost God an awful lot, didn't it? free to us. The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, in Christ Jesus our Lord, not in the world, not in ourselves, in Him. And He gives, He continues in chapter 7 in verse 1 to develop, and He uses an example from the law so that the Jewish listener might understand this concept better. He says, or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, assuming maybe Jewish or assuming that they've learned the Mosaic commandments. And he says that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law. Now, he's referring to a specific law, laws about marriage. And he's going to use this example from the law to prove how we as Christians are no longer under the law, but now we're under grace. He says... For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she's released from the law. As soon as we die to self, as long as we crucify the flesh with its desires, we're not under the law. He continues, so then, while if, while her husband lives, she marries another man, well, that's adulterous. But if her husband dies, she then is free from the law 
of marriage according to the Mosaic commandments so that she is not an adulteress though she has married another man. And therefore, marriage becomes a beautiful example of our new relationship in Christ. He says, Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you should be married to another. That's why we're called the bride of Christ, the church, the bride of Christ. And he wants to present us to the Father, spotless. Married another. To who? To him, Jesus, who raised from the dead, that we should bear the fruit to God. This is our identity. Don't think you're who you used to be. Think you, you are who God now wants you to be. Believe that that's His will for you. Adopt in your heart and in your mind a philosophy for life of bearing fruit to God through a relational reality in Him. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Wow, what a weight lifted off of me. I don't have to focus on satisfying the law as a means of earning God's affection, salvation, attention even. That's not how I do it. I set my affections on Him, Him alone. I follow Him, and I become one with the law, not even focusing on the law. Now, the law is important. I need to know what's the law shows me what sin is. It brings conviction upon me. I confess and I repent when the, when the Holy Spirit uses the law to, to show me my sin. But once I've confessed and repented, I've been cleansed. He's faithful and just to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. So that positionally before God, I'm cleansed, I'm, I'm clean, I'm free. Amen?